Good afternoon, good morning. This is Mark Johnson, the CEO of Loyalty360. Welcome everyone to another edition of our Loyalty360 Leaders in Customer Loyalty series. In this series, we talk to the brand leaders in customer channel and brand loyalty about what they're seeing on the front lines. Uh, today, we have the pleasure of speaking with Nir Patel, who's the president of Belk, a department store chain founded in 1888 and has nearly 300 locations, say, in 16 states. Nir, thank you very much for taking the time to talk to us today. Great. Thanks, Mark. Nice to be here. Nice to meet you as well. Can you tell us a little bit about Belk, people who may not be familiar with your organization, what you guys do and, and how you do it? Yeah, so, you know, you, you set us up nicely. We're, we're a southern retailer. Uh, we're in 16 states, about 300 stores. Uh, we've been around over 130 years, believe it or not. And um, we pride ourselves of being experts of our customer. Um, we think um, being regional is a, is a huge advantage for us. So we're able to buy and procure product and speak to our customer in the environment and regions in which they live. Uh, so we don't have to tell a national story. We kind of tell a story that's relevant to our customer. So um, we're a department store. So we carry everything from air fryers to uh, air fryers, to mattresses, to pillows, to sweats and shoes and jewelry, um, the whole gambit. So uh, we are, you know, kind of what you would consider a traditional department store in that sense. Excellent. So you talked a little bit about kind of the Southern uh, kind of demographic or the, the customer profile. What, did, what does that entail? Do they have uh, unique interests or preferences that uh, are obviously a little different than other regions of the U.S.? Yeah, yeah, definitely. You know, I, just speaking personally, you know, I, I moved here from the Midwest and the weather is very different. <laughs> and so and so, uh, you know, we carry shorts much much, much longer into the into the fall and holiday season than a lot of national retailers do. We don't bring out sweaters uh, in big, big, giant tables starting in August. Uh, our colors, the way we assort our colors are very, very different. Uh, the lifestyle is very different. Um, you know, people in the South tend to be outdoors a lot more due to the weather. So we carry a lot more outdoor gear, a lot more active gear. Um, so those, those are just some of the examples how kind of the lifestyle is really drive some of the product assortment changes that are different. Excellent. Um, for the Belk Rewards Program, can you talk a little bit uh, about the program, how it works, uh, how it was designed, and, and kind of how the program is uh, operating today, kind of what you're seeing from a you know, kind of successful perspective? Yeah, yeah, yeah no. Uh, it, so we have a huge, uh, hugely successful Belk Rewards, uh, our credit card program, um, and there's basically three tiers. There's uh, tier one is um, you sign up for the card and you're automatically in tier one. It's called Belk Rewards. And it's for customers who spend up to $600. When you spend above uh, $600, you get upgraded to Belk Premier. And that's between $600 to $1,500. And when you spend above $1,500, our most special and loyal customers, uh, we upgrade you to a tier three. It's called Belk Elite status. And in each of those tiers, in the first tier, you earn 3% back. In the second tier, you earn 4% back. And in the in the third tier, you earn, or you earn 5% back. Okay, great. Uh, interesting time right now. We uh, we have small sided meetings uh, every week. We actually had one last week just about this topic, really kind of managing tiers and kind of what you're seeing. What, what are you seeing right now? I mean, kind of the, the we've heard the kind of the top tier seem to be doing uh, quite well, but uh, kind of communication, kind of being uh, cognizant of kind of what everyone's going through. How how how, how are you kind of managing those tiers in, in this kind of day and age? Yeah, you know, I mean, it's a lot of change right now. Honestly, it's uh, we're we're seeing. Um, things that are different with our non-card holders, uh, behavior changes with all of our tiers. I, I think in general, uh, you know, our, people want to feel safe, right? And so we want, we're trying to find ways, our most loyal customers, honestly, they love coming into our stores. They love speaking to our associates. They love, you know, they've, they've been going to a store for 20 years and they love speaking to Susan who's been helping them. And they know they, their exact size. So that's a challenge, right? If, 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 we, if that customer does not want to come into the store or does not feel safe coming into the store, we have to find other ways to speak to our customer. So, you know, we are working on kind of re-engaging our customers, showing them different ways, whether it's curbside or buy online pickup in store, or we just launched same day shipping straight to your house. Um, but we're seeing differences across every tier. We're actually seeing a lot more new customers that are not in our Belk Rewards program come to us because they're trying us out for the first time. They're not going to their local store, um, but it's a little bit different across every tier. That's interesting. Um, when you look at, uh, so your program right now is all uh, kind of private label credit card based or kind of right. credit card based. Okay, excellent. Good. So when you look at customer loyalty, uh, we always like to get an understanding of kind of how brands define customer loyalty, what it means to them. And obviously, as you mentioned, things are very fluid right now, but what does customer loyalty at its core mean to Belk? 
Yeah. So, uh, you know, loyalty in my mind, it, it, it basically reinforces the fact that the customer is the most important. It's why we're all here. Right. And, and we're trying to make our customers sticky to us and we're trying to reward them in a way to make them sticky and reward them in a way, whether it's great service, great value, uh, a great safe place to shop, um, easy, convenient um, shipping methods, picking up your orders, things like that. But loyalty to us, it, it's really, really important. We, every retailer, every person tries to hang on to their customers. Uh, we want our customers to feel special. Uh, we get to know our loyalty customers the best. They know us the best. We also get feedback from our loyalty customers. They, they're the most vocal by any <laughs> outside of any customer group. Uh, they tell us what we're doing right, and then they also tell us what we're doing wrong and we can improve on. So it, it's almost it's almost the starting point for every converse, conversation is what are our most loyal customers doing. Excellent. What's the biggest challenge you face during a senior marketer? Uh, obviously, you're president of the organization, which is uh, more senior than just a kind of a, a marketing role. But you know, marketing, customer experience, customer engagement, they're all in- intertwined today. And obviously, that all kind of rolls up to you. What's the biggest challenge you face in that regard today? Yeah, you know, um, for us right now, honestly, it's uh, making our customers feel safe. It, it is the number one challenge. We still have a large group of customers that have not returned to stores and they historically have not felt comfortable buying online. And, and that's, that, that represents an opportunity for us, right? And so how do we make our, feel, our customers feel safe? How do they, if they're, if they're uncomfortable going to stores, what are other ways of delivery? What are other ways of convenience we can provide to them? We're, we're laser focused on that. I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, you know, we have a very large cosmetics business and, you know, we are loyal elite customer always came in to their Lancome counter or their Estee Lauder counter and they did these events in store and we no longer can do some of those events due to safety reasons. Well, we're starting, we started um, digital events where we invite through Facebook some of our most loyal customers and pick, get an expert from one of these brands and uh, they do a, they do a, they kind of do what that, they recreate that entire experience that they had in store, they do it digitally. And our customers love that. And so, you know, the, the biggest challenge right now for us is how do we operate in this new sort of norm? Um, and we're doing it through a lot of digital means. Okay. When you look at the digital events that, you, that you're running, uh, you know, you're obviously leveraging your very, very loyal customers. Um, you know, what are some of the challenges there? Is it kind of creating that same level of engagement? Uh, I know you talked about obviously kind of the, the, the transformation from buy online, picking up a store, buying online, picking up curbside, say same day delivery. That's been a kind of a huge challenge for a lot of uh, retailers, department stores, just being fluid. So not only have to do your day job, right? But you have to come up with new processes internally to really engage the audience in, in a manner they want to. How, how does the digital environment, are you seeing pretty good engagement with that? Yeah. Um, that's awesome. Yeah, no, it's been great. You know, our, our stores organization, our IT organization, our operations, they've been amazing. Honestly, the, anything we throw at them, they, they, they step up to the plate. Uh, we have a very, very sort of agile entrepreneurial organization. Um, we, we turned on ship from store to all stores in early March. Okay. Uh, we rolled out buy online, pick up in store and curbside uh, in all stores in April. Uh, we've just rolled out same. So we're, we're rolling. These, so, so the challenge for us, honestly, hasn't been technology or process, I think the challenge is, get, is getting our customers used to it and right. we're finding different ways to get them used to it. And once they do it once and they have a great experience, we know they'll come back over and over again. Um, so, so and, it's be, and, and it's speaking to all of them, right? So as our marketing spend starts to shift across channel, how do we speak to all of our customers and explain this is, has been a challenge as well. It's interesting that uh, that you, you've been able to do that so quickly because I know a lot of them. You know, we have a number of uh, brands who are members of Local 360, and they talk about some of the challenges. But to be able to do that kind of development that quickly is, it speaks volumes to kind of the success that, you, that you've had for sure. That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, so you talked a little bit about earlier, um, kind of getting people in store, uh, the emotional connection that uh, your customers have with you know the, their store associates. You know, what, uh, what does emotional loyalty mean to, to you and your organization? And, uh, you know, how are you leveraging that part of your customer loyalty efforts? Yeah, I mean, I, I think um, to, to say that our customers are emotional and passionate about Belk, I think it's, it's almost an understatement because the 130 years that we've been around is it, it, it almost creates a, um, an expectation, right? They expect my Belk and some people call it the Belks to to to. to hold up to certain values, certain standards. And so 
Um, we, we have it, we're deeply connected with our customers. We're deeply connected to our communities. Um, you know, I think this holiday, even one of our taglines is family since, since 1888. We've been around for many, many events throughout our country's history and we've survived. And um, so, so uh, we, we appreciate how emotional our customers are, how passionate they are. Um, but they, they, they also hold us to certain standards and, and oftentimes we exceed them, but sometimes we don't and they hold us accountable for that. That's awesome. So when you look at personalization, uh, it's a big opportunity right now, getting the right data, understanding the customers. You mentioned it earlier, having that reciprocity with your customers from telling you what you're doing right and telling you what you're doing wrong. Uh, that's a great thing to have, to have them be so vocal and honest. And when you look at personalization, you know how are you looking to improve personalization efforts as part of your customer loyalty uh, kind of efforts? Yeah, yeah, no. So it, it's something, you know, personalization has been a buzzword or it's been people have been talking about it for, for a few, quite a few years now. Um, and, and honestly, that has been one of the things that um, it, 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 that has definitely required a lot of work, right? Because it, think about it, if you're sending one email and now you want to send 10 different emails to 10 different types of groups, the workload goes up 10 X, right? And so we've been working really, really hard to kind of find efficient ways to be personalized, but we're not doing personalization for personalization's sake. Um, simple things like, Hey, if you shop home a lot, we, we would like to show you home product and bets and shoes, simple things like, Hey, um, you're a you, you're very loyal to cosmetics. Can we show you images and pictures of cosmetics? And can we not only that transition to better offers? Um, so, so we're think we're thinking about personalization through a lot of different lenses right now, but I think two of the most important is content and offer are the two buckets we're focusing on. Okay, great. So you talked a little bit about uh, um, the culture. Uh, it's someone you can trust since the 1888, right? So that long heritage you have with uh, kind of the, the seller audience. And what does the culture mean to your customer experience and loyalty efforts? And, and one of the questions we all like to ask, is how, how are you maintaining that in kind of a, a virtual environment for your you know, employees as well, right? A lot of people are working from home. Uh, working from over extended periods with regard to the, the school systems as well. You know, how, what does culture mean and, and how do you keep that culture kind of intact during uh, you know, just, you know, unique time? I think I lost you there, Mark, at the end. Just how do you keep your culture intact during this unique time, right? With all kind of the changes in fluidity that we see uh, with regard to, you know, COVID-19. Yeah. Yeah. No, so, first, so two things. One, I'll talk internally for a second. Um, you know, we, I would say in many ways, our communication as an organization um, is better than it was pre-COVID. Honestly, we, we, we communicate, our leadership communicates every single day versus kind of your weekly meetings. Our, the next level has the same sort of meeting cadence and the level below has the same sort of meeting cadence. They all have wrap up meetings at the end of the day. And so step one is our communication is really, really strong. I think Step two is culturally, we've always been very, very entrepreneurial. You know, we haven't been the large national retailer and we've been able to do things really fast and really, really sort of with agility. And we've continued that. Any tackle we've had that, whether it's for our customer or for our business, we've kind of put that number one, the leaders of a line and we've gotten it done. And I kind of told you some of the examples uh, from, a, from a shipping perspective. So, you know, we, um, culture means a lot. It, 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 we kind of live it, breathe it every single day. Um, throughout, throughout COVID-19, I think for us as a company, you know, the health and safety of our associates, our customers have been top of mind. We know kind of what parents, I'm a parent, we know what parents are going through right now. I know what I went through with going back to school, not going back to school, who's doing what we, we kind of are very empathetic of that. You know, we, we've kind of, we've extended when we're going back to school until kind of late mid next year by this point. So um, you know, being very empathetic to our associates is something that we're, we're, we're going to continue to do. So um, kind of a lot in there, but culture to us is just take care of our associates, take care of our customers as best as we can. Excellent. Okay. That's good to hear. So when you look at um, kind of the, the, the changes, right, obviously uh, everyone's trying to keep up with kind of customer preferences, how they're changing, how they're evolving, what their interests may be. How have you seen your customers change during this uh, in, in engaging with the department store? Is there anything unique that you've seen in that regard? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, the, the, the first big obvious thing is, is we had a large group of customers who were not shopping both channels. They <laughs> tried e-com for the first time. Honestly, they were always very, very, very 
uh, comfortable with going into their store and the service they received in store. So we saw a channel shift, a, the largest channel shift we've seen. Um, and it's multiple years of channel shift happened for, uh, during COVID. So number one, uh, and number two is, is what they bought, what they buy completely shifted. You know, they were, we had, we were selling a ton of dress shirts and jackets and dresses and dress shoes. We stopped selling a lot of it. Now we still sell a little bit of it, but not to the level we do. Um, and, and we're selling a lot more home products. We're selling a lot more soft blankets, we're selling a lot of stretchy fleece, uh, you know, hoodies like you're wearing uh, that we haven't had sale. You know, there's some of the highest sales we've had in years. So we've seen not only sort of a channel shift, but also shift by product category in quite dramatic ways. That's interesting. So when you look at, um, uh, you know, kind of the data you have, data analytics, obviously big opportunity for marketers and, and, and you have such a draconian shift, right? People are seeing that big channel shift. You have kind of new products and services that you're rolling out. How do you look at all that data uh, and create actionability for kind of your customer centricity efforts? Yeah, no, it's a lot. You can get lost in it. I mean, I, I get lost in it and, and my team sometimes gets lost in it. Um, so, so, you know, data, data, data is, is kind of what everyone talks about, big data and how do we mine the data? I, I, I think it starts with what are we trying to do, right? Like, like the way I kind of help our teams focus a little bit is what are we trying to achieve? And in the short term, what we're trying to achieve is we're trying to get our customer comfortable to either come into our store or try us online. And it's that simple for now. You know, our, our, our zero to 12 month strategy is we've got all these amazing customers and there are just some customers who are not comfortable coming back into the store. So how do we re-engage those customers? So we start with a clear problem we're trying to solve and we make sure it's not three, four, five, six problems. And then we go mine the data to help us solve that problem. We're not looking to the data to tell us the big picture. I think we feel really pretty good about our strategy. And so we go in with specific questions and then we use the data to answer the questions versus open up the world because we can get lost in there a little bit. Well, that makes perfect sense. So when you look at kind of the KPIs for the program, as I mentioned earlier, a lot of brands are kind of struggling right now with kind of tier management, right? And obviously you said you're doing very, very well. Um, you know, how do you look at, or maybe what are some of the KPIs that you're looking at for customer loyalty? Uh, and kind of, is it just on the program or is it bigger picture around maybe social and uh, channel engagement as well? I mean, what metrics are you looking at? Yeah, no, we look at we look at a whole range of metrics. Uh, retention is obviously a key one for us. Uh, engagement, the number of times they're they're using their cards over years, how much they're spending on their card, um, units per transactions, etc. Um, but I, I think I think the big one right now is just um, how often are they shopping? You know, and how and and how uh, has someone historically someone shops every month, every two months? Now they're shopping every three months, every six months. That becomes that that's a red flag for us, but. Looking at that engagement level is probably the biggest um, single metric we look at. There are other things like engagement across channels, engagement social, et cetera. But right now, we're, we're almost, <laughs> in my mind, I'm like, let's leave no man or woman behind. And if, if I'm seeing a drop off in engagement, we're leaving somebody behind. We're leaving a customer behind and we need to go back and get them. Okay, great. Is there any interest in maybe having kind of a multi-tender program or uh, is the, the kind of the, the, the credit card program uh, kind of the, the, the main focus for now? No, no, we are. It's, it's something of, of, of big, uh, you know, probably uh, the next thing we're going to work on. So we've got our private label credit card. We also have a MasterCard as well. Uh, we are actively looking at um, different ways. We're looking at a non-tender program as we speak. Um, but the, the, the private label program will always be sort of the core and bread and butter of the, of the program, but we are going to look at other ways to kind of get her, get him or her into the funnel. Um, the, the, the next question, uh, kind of when you look at peers, are there, uh, like programs that you kind of monitor FC? So not, maybe not necessarily other department stores, but when you look at customer loyalty, do you look at other groups and what they're doing and, and do you try to learn from those uh, groups as well? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, you know, we look, we look at, obviously we look at retail and we look at immediate department store. Um, it, but for me, you know, I love looking at airlines and hotels. I think those are probably, they, they have a very sticky loyalty program, right? Um, anytime I look at loyalty, I, I break it down to, I try to make it in layman's sums for myself, at least. It's like, why do I, why am I going to spend another hundred dollars on American when the Delta flight is cheaper? It's maybe because I have status on American, right? And and it, that's the ultimate win, right? It's it's you made American got another hundred dollars because I get to walk in this other line faster, and and so you know 
how do we make it st- when I look at airlines or hotels that I do think fundamentally change behavior. You know, when I search, when I was Starwood, I would only search Starwood hotels for every family vacation. Retail isn't just isn't that sticky because there's just so many choices. But I, we do look to learn from them and are uh, quite a bit on things they do and add not just room upgrades, things like that, but they have a lot of experiential thing they've, they've added as well um, that we've learned, looked at. But probably hotels and airlines are the two industries I look to the most. Okay, great. You know, if you uh, would love to introduce, you know, you know, if you go to the guys at Wyndham or IHG, they're members and you know, I think the, their senior vice presidents would love to talk to you, maybe kind of have some empathy back and forth with some of the things you guys are doing and, and look at it. And it's a great community and, you know, would love to facilitate those introductions if you have an interest. Absolutely. Absolutely. The last question I think I have for you is, uh, you know, what can we do as a trade association for the industry, help you uh, with you and your journey and your team? Yeah, you know, I, I think, um, I think data is d- data is always important. I think sharing best practices is is I think always helpful. I'm a big believer in um, kind of all boats will rise, right? There's no secret box, and um, you know, great customer service is and great great templates for customer service or great templates for loyalty. Um, I think is important. Uh, transparency along with that, I think folks like you guys can make things very very transparent. All of that helps us. I think we're we're as a retailer. We see things through our lens um, and through our customers. And sometimes we might be missing kind of new and emerging ways to look at things. So I think continue to do and continue doing with you, what you guys do, but um, being very just transparent on what's working and what's not really helps folks like me. Excellent. Well, uh, Nira, thank you very much for taking the time to talk to us today. It was very interesting you know, learn more about Belk uh, and uh, your program, kind of your focus. I think, uh, you know, the, 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 what you're doing for your customers and truly trying to be empathetic and, and, and you know, understanding kind of what they're going through, I think is uh, uh, commendable for sure. And uh, it was great talking to you for sure. Well, thanks a lot, Mark. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Uh, thanks, everyone. Uh, talk to you soon.